Hello ladies and gentlemen, Top Hat Gaming Man here, welcoming you to another video from a channel that is quickly becoming the weebiest channel on the information superhighway. As things stand, I am currently on a quest to cover every corner of console history, and as a result I have found myself talking a lot about bloody Japan. Within the console specific arena, there is no denying that systems from that region have had a great impact on gaming history, and the nation remains the king of consoles right up until this very day. The most important year in the country's history for gaming was 1983, a year we should all remember for beginning the video game boom. 1983 saw gaming taking more steps forward than any other time in history, as this was the year the Nintendo Famicom was released on Japanese shores. If you have watched this channel previously, you will be well aware that Nintendo were not the only company to release console hardware that year in the land of the rising sun. We also had the Sega SG-1000, Gakken Compact TV Boy, Atari 2800 and Casio PV-1000, just to name a few of the contenders. Today we are going to look at the history of another platform that saw a release in Japan during that fateful year. This ladies and gentlemen is the history of another forgotten gaming oddity. This is the story of Tomi Pewter Jr. Yeah! To explore the history of the Tomi game console, we shall start by looking at the history of the company behind the product. Way back in 1924, a gentleman known as Ichiro Tomiyama founded Tomiyama to Seskushka. I uh, probably can't pronounce that right. An entity that would go on to eventually be known as Tomi Company Limited. The company would start out by manufacturing a range of toy aeroplanes. However, it would not be long until the company would diversify its range of products. Tomi would soon make history by becoming the first company in the toy industry to both open a factory of its own assembly line and to create its own toy research and development division. All in all, Tomiyama made huge contributions towards modernising the toy industry as a whole, predating the efforts made by Bandai, who we've also talked about on here before, by nearly 30 years. Just after the end of World War II, which is another pivotal period we keep revisiting in the Japanese console history videos, alongside both Bandai and Gakken, Tomi would reach new levels of success under the new capitalist parliamentary based political system. Although, in a rather dark twist, Tomi became an international success in the US market by selling B 29 bomber friction toys. The B 29 bomber? was the aircraft model that carried the atomic bombs that levelled both Nagasaki and Hiroshima. So, with a Japanese company profiting in the US directly off the back of these events, it is certainly somewhat of an ethical conundrum, which I welcome all of you to discuss in the comments section. By the time the 60s rolled around, plastic was quickly replacing metal when it came to the materials toys were made from, and Tomy were rapidly expanding opening offices in both North America and Europe as a result. By the 70s, manufacturing was expanded from just Japan to both Hong Kong and Singapore too, and the company successfully celebrated 50 years in the toy business. It is the 80s though, which we are obviously most interested in talking about today, and as usual, Tomy were looking to market toys that would fall in line with social trends of the period. Replicas of aircraft that killed millions of people were no longer the favourite toys for children, and instead the computing and electronic toy era was upon us. In 1982, Tomy would release its own microcomputer, known as the Tomy Pewter. This product designed by the Japanese toy maker is said to be architecturally similar in many ways to the Texas Instrument TI-99, and even used a Texas Instrument 16-bit CPU. Whilst Tomy were primarily a toy company, in order to make this product a reality, they would have to collaborate with Matsushita, a company we all know internationally as Panasonic. The system itself, like many micros of the period, featured a QWERTY keyboard which featured 56 rubber keys and a large pink spacebar. The system could display 16 different colours and featured a 9-pin D-Sub joystick port. 
and RF output and video composite slash audio outputs. For running games and software, the platform features both a cartridge slot for cartridge-based media along with a 5DIN plug to connect up a tape recorder. The system was released in Japan and featured Nihongo Basic, which used Japanese characters and words. However, this obviously differed with the international releases. The Tomy Pewter was released overseas in both the UK and the United States, and this time featured two more coding languages. This time G Basic and Tomy Basic. In the US the product was renamed the Tomy Tutor, and in the UK the product was renamed the Grandstand Tutor, with Grandstand being the distributor for the Tomy product in that market. The Tomy Pewter, despite being a fairly decent microcomputer for its time with a nice little selection of games, sadly flopped in every market it entered. Outside of Japan, particularly in the UK, the aim was to compete with the likes of the Commodore 64 and the ZX Spectrum, two platforms that are remembered fondly for coding and gaming in the region right up until this very day. In some ways, the Pewter, or Tutor as it's known, was superior in capabilities to what those other platforms could offer. Although, one key factor is blamed for the Tutor's failure and obscurity, which lies with the marketing of the platform itself. Unlike the Spectrum and C64, the Tutor was announced and marketed as no more than a toy. A computer for children! Despite the fact that the product was practically a cheap, evolved version of the TI-99. As mentioned earlier in the video, the system even featured a similar 16-bit CPU. Maybe the Tutor could have ended up a more popular appliance if it was marketed as more than a simple baby's toy. With the failings of the Pewter, it would not be long before all efforts to market this system in the US and Europe were completely ditched. In Japan, on the other hand, Tomy would continue to try and find a way to market this product. In 1983, Tomy would release an upgraded version of the device, known as the Tomy Tutor Mark II. This version of the system would feature a standard mechanical keyboard, as opposed to the more basic option they had presented previously. Further from this, Tomy had taken note of the serious success levels Nintendo were having with their Famicom console. So in one last push to save the product, Tomy would redesign the hardware once again, and release a consoleized version of the Tutor. This new platform, which we marketed as the Tomy Pewter Jr., would retail at 19,800 yen and would feature no keyboard, instead featuring only keys that are used by the system's games. The ability for the platform to use G Basic was also reportedly removed, leaving the system with just the capabilities to play games and draw on screen, which I suppose is at least something that diversified the device from that of the Famicom. The Pewter Jr. was backwards compatible with the Pewter library, and featured its own small library of games too. Graphically, like the majority of platforms that competed with the Famicom in 1983, the Pewter Jr. featured ColecoVision-like graphics, and as a result was unable to keep up with what Nintendo had on offer at the time. Both the Tomy Pewter and Pewter Jr. were both discontinued by 1985 and reportedly only sold a combined 140,000 units throughout the console and microcomputer's life cycles. The Pewter Jr. is just another example of a platform trying to cash in on the success of the Nintendo Famicom. However, the Pewter itself could have been a potential competitor for the likes of the ZX Spectrum and Commodore 64 if it had just been positioned in the market that little bit smarter. Either way, both of these systems are interesting, overlook parts of gaming history, and play a role in the overarching narrative of gaming story. It is quite interesting to look back and see Nintendo successfully marketing their product as a toy, while simultaneously seeing bigger toy giants like Tomy and Bandai coming along, only to fail when trying to replicate the same process. Anyway, I am the Top Hat Gaming Man, and I hope you enjoyed learning about the Pewter Systems. I produce videos like this on rare hardware every single week. And if you enjoyed this video, I would urge you to like this video, leave a comment, subscribe and hit the notification bell to receive content directly to your multimedia devices. Yeah. Finally, my channel Topic Gaming Man is funded by the fantastic support I receive from my amazing Patreon 
contributors who continuously go above and beyond to preserve this channel's life and propel me forward. So shout outs to Carl Johnson, Suzuka Kobayashi, JD Robbins, Greg Hooper, Sebast the Great, Synth Spaces, Kevin Verhaley, Andrew Byzanski, Edward O'Reilly, Tom Elliott, Mark S. Hines, Huang DX, SpongeMap B, Michael Baker, Hans Christian, Computer Man, and all of my other patrons. Thank you all for continuing to change my life.